to it soon. Okay. Warami, uh, this is uh, good to see you in Darug, uh, Sydney's traditional language. My name is Doro Kostake. I am greeting you from the land of the Garigal, a clan uh, of the Guringai people where I live, and uh, a land currently known as the Berenjoy Peninsula. Uh, it is my pleasure to moderate the second session of the Faith and Science stream, a stream which, together with Nikla Hoger Cregan, I am organizing for the second year in a row at ANZATS. We represent the two major faith and science organizations in our respective countries, uh, NZCIS in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and East Coast in Australia. The first session of this stream yesterday was exciting and insightful. This one promises to be an excellent match with a paper at a crossing of environmental and religious studies and the other exploit an aspect of the early Christian experience in China. Now, our first speaker, Lisa Sederis, is Professor of uh, Environmental Studies with affiliation in Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Lisa will talk about keeping faith with monarch butterflies, science and spirituality in an age of extinction. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my slides. Okay, everyone can see that. Okay. How's the sound? Does it sound okay? Yep, all good. Thank you um, for the introduction. It's nice to see you all. Um, some of you I know, and some of you, your names I've heard, so I look forward to talking to you. Um, if, if you need me to cut this <clears throat> short a little bit, because we're starting a bit late, then I'll just let me know, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, I'll leave some for discussion and just cut it short if I have to, so... Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking about butterflies and specifically monarch butterflies, which I believe you have <laughs> as well in Australia, um, although they're not native there, but they, um, they, I think they came from California probably. So we got your eucalyptus trees and, you know, we gave you our monarchs or something like that. So humans, it said, are meaning-making creatures. The meanings we make of life and death are indebted to and co-created with our non-human kin. All organisms play valuable roles in their ecological and evolutionary contexts, but some species bear cultural gifts and meanings beyond those evolutionary roles. Birds, for example, are almost universally regarded as otherworldly emissaries. Their appearance and songs carry specific messages of hope, comfort, or warning. Birds are often the first creatures to display warning signs of wider environmental threats like pollution or climate extremes. And like birds, butterflies too are imbued with sacred meanings across many cultures, and they play a prominent role in folklore, art, and seasonal ceremonies, both religious and secular. Like birds, migrating species of butterflies are especially vulnerable to abrupt changes in their environment. That humans look to these creatures for meaning is no coincidence. Often they have something important to tell us. Rich in symbolism and beauty, butterflies are almost endearingly useless by many conventional human standards. For some, the lack of clear-cut utilitarian value may lend butterflies a certain charm, but for scientists seeking to communicate the urgency of their decline, their relative uselessness can be vexing. Calls for butterfly protection in the media often hype their pollinating powers, but unlike bees and beetles, butterflies are not powerhouse pollinators. If all butterflies were to disappear, so would a few flowers, but not many. In thinking about butterflies, it seems important to conceive of values in ways that sidestep the usual dichotomy that we've inherited from environmental ethics between intrinsic value on the one hand and utilitarian or anthropocentric values on the other. What might it mean for humans to need butterflies in vital but less tangible ways? For starters, we might describe our need for them as spiritual or imaginative or imaginal maybe is the word. Writer and activist Rebecca Solnit worries that the loss of close contact with nature and animals over time might result in the diminishment of our imaginative capacities, eventually stripping down English into a kind of news speak, she says. So we talk about the wolf at the door or of lambs to the slaughter, but how many people now even know how a mule kicks or what it looks like to see bees making a beeline? Does anyone alive today even know how many swallows a summer makes? And when speech goes blank, Solnit observes, imagination will have preceded it. 
The loss of creatures like butterflies and especially monarchs may impoverish our ability to process our worlds and its rhythms of life and death and to bear witness to degradation and death, that of ourselves and that of other creatures. It's no exaggeration to say that butterflies have long been an object of human obsession. Butterflies generally and monarchs in particular are widely believed to carry the souls of the dead. A transboundary species, monarchs' arduous and precarious migrations symbolize hope and perseverance, especially for migrants and others who are dispossessed of their homes and lands. Monarchs elicit reflection on cycles of rebirth, renewal, resurrection, owing to their mysterious emergence in radically altered bodily form from a tomb-like chrysalis. Thus, butterfly metamorphosis and the seasonal return of migrating butterflies offer a comforting symbol of transition and transformation, not because humans welcome change, but because we so often fear and resist it. What would happen if a symbol of hope and continuity in the face of change becomes through extinction a symbol of loss? In a way, monarchs already do symbolize loss, but they have enabled humans to process the loss of death in ways that bring comfort and spiritual enrichment. Reflecting on the ancient life ways of monarch butterflies may help to broaden our understanding of all that is potentially lost when a species goes extinct and why those losses are sometimes hard to categorize. Often hailed as symbols of freedom, escape, unfettered mobility and radical change, monarchs are also suggestive of cyclical return and continuity. They are central to a worldview that is life-giving even in its acceptance of death. Butterfly meaning-making is evident in the sheer prolifer proliferation of terms that humans have appended to butterflies, like so many efforts to pin down metaphorically something elusive and mysterious. Even within closely related languages, the word for butterfly exhibits stunning variability, while often gesturing towards a sort of common core of something magical or enigmatic. There are at least 16 different words and 16 different European languages for the butterfly, probably others that I don't know of in indigenous languages, linking the butterfly variously to witches, women, souls, birds, flowers, fluttering mists, and fairies. The commonly known Spanish name Mariposa, which means Mary or Maria alight, right? So like having the, you know, Maria or the, Mar you know, butterfly land on you, which is often considered to be a sacred experience. That has links to the Virgin Mary, whose praying hands resemble a butterfly. In Senegal, vernacular names for Lepidoptera, that is both butterflies and moths, have associations with religion and religious figures, paper of God, for example, or God's fan. Dark-hued butterflies and moths are associated with souls of the dead. The butterfly as an avatar of the soul is evident in links between butterflies, the Greek word for soul, and the ancient myth of Eros and Psyche, and Psyche is um, pictured at the top center here. Psyche was a mortal woman granted immortality by Zeus. Imagery surrounding her often depicts butterfly wings. The modern Greek word for butterfly is petroluda, associated with petal or opening out, but in classical Greek the word is rendered as Psyche in recognition of the butterflies as souls of the dead. Time-honored associations of butterflies with returning souls of the dead are especially pronounced in the case of monarchs, as we will see. The Swiss-American psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who's famous for her stages of grief, described in her memoir seeing hundreds of butterflies etched into the walls by Jewish children, prisoners of a Polish concentration camp. She concluded that the etchings expressed the prisoners longed for escape from suffering and isolation, but also hope for some continued existence in a world beyond. These butterflies provided the imagery that Kubler-Ross would use with dying patients for the rest of her career as she sought to document and comprehend the process of death and dying. And there are also some images here of children's uh, poetry, often about butterflies written in concentration camps. Butterflies often play a central role in community identity. The small town of Pacific Grove in Monterey County, California provides one example of monarch devotion. The town has constructed much of its annual rhythms and indeed its civic identity around monarch migration. Annual migration boosts tourism, of course, but the town's investment in the monarch goes much deeper. In 2020, when not a single monarch returned to Pacific Grove, townspeople began to wonder how life in Pacific Grove could continue in a meaningful way. 
The Monarch is the city's logo. Signs posted around town welcome visitors to Butterfly City, USA. Motels and other businesses are named in honor of butterflies in an annual parade in October, where kindergarten children dressed as butterflies welcome the monarchs, has been commemorating their seasonal arrival since 1939. My own town of Goleta, California, in southern Santa Barbara County, similarly boasts of being a butterfly town, owing to the presence of popular overwintering sites. Goleta is actually a Spanish word for a type of schooner, a nod to the popularity of these vessels in Spanish times when the area provided refuge for ships during wet winter months. However, when Goleta was officially declared an incorporated city, which would only happen in 2002, the image chosen for the city's seal, which you can see here, depicted to the great irritation of some, not the area's rich maritime history, either Spanish or post-colonial, but the familiar orange and black butterfly drifting above rows of agricultural fields and stylized ocean waves. A municipal webpage is devoted entirely to monarch preservation and educational initiatives. Sadly, monarch populations in Goleta overwintering sites have seen historic lows for nearly a decade. Although with a slight trend upward since 2021 or really 2022, so basically since I got here, they've been trending upward. In the wake of Monarch's recent no-shows in places like Pacific Grove and Goleta, some politicians have proposed legislation to restore and maintain the overwintering sites where eucalyptus trees provide critical shelter. These plans, however, generate additional controversy among warring factions of environmentalists because eucalyptus trees are a non-native, moderately invasive tree. They're regarded by many Californians as little more than a fire-prone water, water hogging weed. They're regarded by, um, sorry, California's great eucalyptus debate continues to pit monarch lovers against native plant societies, greens against greens. Despite shocking declines in monarchs, as much as 80% for Eastern monarchs, that's the ones that come from, uh, you know, down from Mexico up all the way to Canada, and 99% decline in Western monarch populations, which overwinter here on the coast. Despite those declines, monarchs have only this year been red listed as endangered. And that is not an official status yet that actually guarantees them sort of legal protection for reasons that are complicated. In the last year or so, Western monarchs have staged an encouraging though highly provisional comeback here where I live on California's central coast. The uptick in populations in 21 and 22 was a welcome sign, but it takes years to determine if recovery is really underway. That uptick filed an exceedingly bleak turnout in 2020. You can see these signs. This is at Pismo Beach. I took this picture. You can see how much they've been going down. Um, even though they've gone back up again, it's nothing compared to what their numbers used to be. So that bleak turnout in 2020 seemed to mark the beginning of the end for monarchs. The causes of the apparent rebound remain poorly understood because so much about monarchs is shrouded in mystery. Habitat loss, deforestation, herbicide, and pesticide are all implicated in the monarch's decline, and climate change is also a factor. Some researchers link monarchs' decline to the loss of their host plant, milkweed, um, which once grew abundantly in the US. Um, I'll say more about that in a moment. Monarch migration is a multi-generational, tri-national affair. Migration from Mexico to the north spans at least four generations over the course of the summer, as each successive generation lays eggs at sites further and further north. The last generation born in this process is notably different from its parents and grandparents, who complete their life cycle in about four weeks. Indeed, the final generation that journeys back south to Mexico is often called a Methuselah butterfly and it constitutes a different sort of butterfly altogether. These super generations can live up to eight months. They postpone mating and egg laying and fuel up on nectar to prepare for a you know, 3,000 or more mile journey south, clustering in overnight roosts along the way. What is most astonishing is that these long-lived butterflies, generations removed from the previous cycle's overwintering ancestors, somehow know how to return to a place they have never seen before thousands of miles away. No one is quite certain how they accomplish this. For amateurs and scientists alike, the complexity of the butterfly's long migration inspires spiritual and devotional interest. Their epic journey also anchors seasonal and religious rites and bioregional character. Annual migrations are greeted, 
sorry, I lost my paper, are greeted with um, Thanksgiving Day butterfly counts, much like Christmas Day bird counts, and a variety of celebrations. People flock by the thousands to monarch overwintering sites. This is Pismo Beach, where I took this photo last November. It's difficult to overstate the emotional impact of the spectacle of roosting monarchs, particularly at a time when their seasonal return cannot be assumed. Spectators often assume a reverential attitude, speaking in hushed tones and smiling beatifically as they gaze upward at stands of lofty trees magically transformed by undulating clusters of orange wings. It's not uncommon for people to weep and pray spontaneously. Significantly, monarchs play an integral role in rituals surrounding the Day of the Dead, a 3000 year old tradition originating in central Mexico that takes place at the beginning of November when monarch migration is peaking. <clears throat> These rituals are a legacy of Catholic influence on much older Mesoamerican cosmogonies and ritual practices. Monarchs have traditionally been welcomed as souls of ancestors returning for a yearly visit. Particularly strong associations link monarchs with the souls of children. In some parts of Mexico, the dead are buried in caskets that feature a tiny hole where the soul of the dead in the form of a butterfly can exit. Day of the Dead rituals celebrate the dead with food, drink, dancing, and offerings of various sorts on brightly colored altars. Artificial monarchs are often placed on private and public altars alongside the traditional flame orange Mexican marigold, whose vibrant color mirrors the monarch. Participants often dress in monarch costumes, papier mache skeletons are fitted with monarch wings. Traditional ecological knowledge in Mexico links the monarch to agricultural cycles. They're locally referred to as harvesters because their departure to the north signals the time to prepare the soil again for the next agricultural cycle. Ethnohistoric studies affirm pre-Hispanic associations of monarchs with the sun god, the creator and giver of life. Myths regarding the metamorphosis of the sun's god's rays into monarchs capture their significance as a life-giving creature. The lives of individual butterflies come and go in the cyclical process around which so many cross-cultural events are organized, but the cycle itself continues on, or rather it has for perhaps millions of years until this moment when one dominant and uniquely destructive species is causing this ancient procession to falter. Monarch extinction raises the specter of death for a creature on whom many have long depended to cope with death, to make peace with it and its place in the broader scheme of life. When humans become the agents of species death, are we then culpable for the ancestor's failure to return as in the day of the dead rituals? What practices and meanings might go extinct along with monarchs? Fortunately, many people are actively working to prevent their extinction, but there's a need to educate the public on the best ways to help monarchs. Assisting their survival is a complex and messy affair that re reveals additional layers of entanglement between us and them. In some cases, well-intentioned efforts to ensure the butterfly survival might actually disrupt its way of life, jeopardizing the very qualities that humans have come to revere. For example, the public is often advised to plant milkweed, as I mentioned before, the host plant for egg-laying females and growing caterpillars. Varieties of milkweed are distributed at public, to the public at monarch festivals, and monarchs are in reproductive diapause during the winter, meaning that they cease mating and egg-laying during this period. But in mild climates and regions made milder by climate change, milkweed may not die back, continuing instead to bloom year-round. This encourages monarchs to keep laying eggs rather than embark on their iconic journeys. This is especially the case with non-native tropical varieties of milkweed that remain evergreen throughout winter. Though conservation groups warn against it, many citizens have also taken it upon themselves to rear monarchs in captivity and school children often do this in science classes as well in an effort to boost the population. Monarchs are also raised commercially for release at celebratory events like weddings, don't do that bad idea. Some studies indicate that captive bred monarchs lack the capacity to migrate, while others suggest they might recover migratory abilities if given enough time to orient themselves. Conservation programs often rely on captive breeding and release, and so it's worrying to think that this strategy is ill-suited to monarchs. Spiritual values probably play a much bigger role in environmental ethics and conservation than we realize. Certain organisms have been designated as possible 
cultural keystone species. The IPBES, that is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, defines the cultural keystone species as follows, quote, species whose existence and symbolic value shape in a major way and over time the cultural identity of a people as reflected in the fundamental roles these species have in diet, materials, medicine, and or spiritual practices, end quote. Among the criteria that define cultural keystone species, some scholars have suggested the following, the prevalence of stories that link the species to myths, to the ancestors or the origin of the culture, the role a species plays in major rituals that are integral to community identity, and the species' physical existence within a specific territory inhabited by the cultural group in question, which I think applies equally to parts of Mexico as it does many parts of California. One objection to thinking of species as having special values like these is that we might be biased in prioritizing some over others, but preferential treatment and ranking of species occurs already in conservation all the time. Often it's invertebrates that lose out in the charisma competition. 90, over 90% of species are invertebrates and they are usually not seen as being the sort of um, poster you know, species, the sort of flagship species that are promoted to the public. So just being an invertebrate you know, is a dangerous thing in this world where people don't value them very much. By contrast, reverence for creatures like monarchs across many cultures entails an implicit acknowledgement of their sacred and irreplaceable status. Affirming the special status of monarchs in indigenous Mexican cultures and traditions, and those traditions that emerge from Hispanic and Catholic influence on indigenous beliefs and practices, is an important step in redressing past and present environmental injustices. Given that indigenous peoples have been dispossessed of species and lands deemed sacred and central to their way of life. Thinking with butterflies suggests the impossibility of isolating even our best and purest intentions and interventions from their complex contexts and consequences. To say this is not to succumb to a fatalistic view that nothing that we could do to protect endangered species matters. It's rather to acknowledge that life-enhancing and death-dealing forces cannot be as neatly delineated as humans might like, either in the physical world that we inhabit or in our deliberate interventions in the non-human world. The impossibility of delivering ourselves from moral complexity and of disentangling life from death speaks to a non-negotiable feature of our own status as finite embodied creatures. Monarchs are powerful winged reminders of these parameters because paradoxically they bring us back down to earth and earthly materialities while simultaneously letting our imagination soar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, this was uh, wonderful and uh, a talk with uh, so much uh, resonance for uh, people living, like all of us here in uh, places that uh, were traditionally inhabited by others, much more wise than we are and much more appreciative of these rhythms of, uh, of nature and uh, in incorporated these rhythms in, in their own culture and uh, way of life. For example, uh, the Garigal uh, clan that I mentioned earlier, uh, on whose lands many people live in this uh, area, have gone extinct uh, at the arrival of, uh, of uh, white uh, colonials. And um, now we have uh, only the signs and whatever the the symbols of their rebirth in uh, all those rock carvings and all that, but uh, where are they? How much have we lost? Now, uh, I assume that uh, there will be comments and questions from uh, uh, from the audience uh, who's into uh, questioning the topic or the presentation. The land, please. Thank you very much, Lisa, for a really fascinating a presentation. I, I'm currently working on a John Wesley's survey of the wisdom of God in the creation, which is 1766 mm -hmm. work of natural philosophy, mostly borrowed from other people with a few pious flourishes, which is Wesley's kind of tendency to do that sort of thing. Um, but he makes a really interesting observation. One of the themes in the work is that 
human reason is very limited in its capacity to understand the wisdom of God displayed within creation. Um, and he perhaps overestimate, uh, sorry, underestimates the capacity, you know, of scientific knowledge. Obviously, he's writing from the 18th century, um, the context. But he makes the point that while we cannot know much, we may love much. And he puts forward an argument that loving the creation, loving every little worm and every little creature <laughs> is a kind of a motivating factor for caring for and preserving and um, yes for giving thanks to god whose wisdom brought it all into being but at the same time there's an implication at least that it would also be a motivating factor for our ecological responsibility at least that's the way i'm trying to spin it <laughs> in in the book chapter um and and you know you mentioned in your presentation that people watching the monarchs resting might just spontaneously pray or you know they're sort of move into a space of meditation and and i thought that was an interesting example of that so i'm just wondering about your thoughts about you know love love for nature as a kind of a motivating factor in you know and preservation and ecological care yeah i i think with monarchs especially it's really strong um this is part of a longer paper that i'm writing and there's a, a piece that i was reading the other day that was about um whether monarchs could could actually be put forward as a kind of what they call a flagship species, which are the ones that are, you know, that 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 conservation organizations often kind of promote to the public when they're fundraising and things like that. And they were these people were making a case that um, that monarchs actually seem to be a good candidate for that because then they did a survey on this. Um, the the values that people most commonly associated with with monarchs were or wonder, um, beauty, um, resilience, and strength. Um, they often associated them with the loss of a loved one. This is a very common experience that people have um, in popular culture as well as in specific religious traditions. Um, but one of the really significant things they found was that for, for a lot of people, so they you know invited people to tell a story about monarchs to kind of give their own kind of personal narrative. And in many, many cases, people referred back to um, childhood experiences of either, you know, having some association with them, just a spontaneous encounter or learning in school about monarchs. And that seemed to like really stick with people. So um, it's also the, the fragility of monarchs that evokes this kind of altruistic response um, and a caretaking response. So even though what people typically respond to is being like, you know, the most charismatic species, which are usually things that are very large, things that have forward-facing eyes, you know, bears and tigers and things like that. It's really strong with monarchs. And a lot of it is because people have these very delightful associations from childhood um, and really kind of fell in love with them in childhood and have kept that feeling throughout their lives. So um, I think a lot of those feelings are out there and we just no one has asked people about these things. Yeah. Thank you. Hermina? Yes, thank you for that wonderful paper, Lisa. I don't know uh, much about monarchs, except when I was in school, I saw uh, from 95 or 96, that's when we were learning that they were being, um, that there was a, a decrease in, in the monarchs. But my question is about uh, the, um, the comment you made about the soul and the butterflies. And this might be a scandalizing question um, because, well, we consider the butterflies of the soul um, neurons. So I, I'm a neuroscientist. Oh, wow. We consider that to be the butterflies of, of the soul. But my uh, question um, is, I know that the soul is a, a pre-Christian term and um, more and more with the discoveries in, in my field, many things that were originally attributed to the soul are explained by neuroscience now. So I don't know if this is a question you can answer. I wonder if we perhaps might, yeah, maybe comment a little bit about the soul and the and the butterflies that you made this connection very early in your in your in your presentation, in the context of what I'm saying, that that a lot, 
of what is attributed to the soul is now explained by neuroscience. So where is the soul? Is this a term that is out of date now? Should we be considering something else? Yeah, I, well, I mean, people mean different things by the soul. I think, um, you know, it's also, it's connected to the word for just being something that's animate, right? And, you know, it's also connected with breath and, you know, a lot of different languages. But I think that what, um, I'm skeptical that science could ever kind of do away with that concept in the sense that like monarchs are a good example of this because as much as we know about them, there's just so much that we don't know still about why they do what they do and how they do it. Um, it may be something that that's just a matter of time before science will figure that out. But I think what what I would say is partly the soul element of that is sort of two things. One is is them representing human souls, which of course is still a somewhat anthropocentric way of looking at them. Like they're valuable because they represent the souls of other humans. But I think there's something else too that is the the mystery of butterflies. Like what, even if we can explain it sort of scientifically, we can't explain um, sort of why they do it or why they do it in this way. I mean, it wouldn't it be much simpler if they had evolved some sort of survival strategies that were that didn't require them to fly, you know, 3,000 miles or something, or to strangely like turn from one kind of creature into another. I mean, the process of that is pretty well understood by science because there are these cells that they're called imago cells, fascinatingly. Um, and when the caterpillar begins to develop these cells, the, its immune system like attacks these things because it needs to have an immune response to something that looks foreign and weird. And eventually the cells begin to, the imago cells out, you know, outpace the immune system and it can't compete and they begin to communicate with one another. And that's how it turns into this very different thing. And I don't know, I just think there's aspects of that that even when it's understood by science, there's the fact that it works in this way is just so amazing. And nothing will ever sort of take away, I think, that kind of wonder at what a bizarre creature this is and how did it evolve in this way? It's just such a strange way to live, right? It's remarkable. Beautiful. Uh, Mick, uh, one uh, final question from you or comment. Thanks, Doro. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Um, Good to see you. There's an Australian philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, who coined, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, mm -hmm. the term solastalgia, mm -hmm. uh, which is this idea of mourning something while you're seeing it basically in freefall and collapse. I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit, either from the community point of view, whose iconography centers around this butterfly, or maybe your own personal point of view, of what it's like to be watching a species pot potentially go extinct, you know, how that's mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's really, it's interesting. I was, um, we met some friends at the Botanic Garden a couple of days ago here in Santa Barbara and I overheard a conversation, one of them saying to her sister, they're talking about getting tattoos. And she said, well, I'd like to get a monarch, but you know, if they go extinct, I would feel really terrible having a monarch tattoo. You know, it's just like, this is something that just people think about all the time now like these what if these things aren't around I don't want to get a tattoo or something like that um I feel so I mean I'm new to the west coast and so you know seeing I have seen them in Mexico years ago I saw them there but those some of those pictures you saw you know I took myself and it's so overwhelming um and so overwhelmingly sad um I mean it's it's not like anything I have really felt before, but I was reading a book about scientists who work on corals, coral reefs, and it's called The Coral Whisperers. It's really fascinating. Um, and how grief-stricken they are in, you know, having to train as scientists to do work on with a species that may not be around much longer. And I think it really speaks to the spiritual dimension of all of this that people feel that they they have to do whatever they can you know and it's such a to me it's such a sharp contrast the affective dimension of how people talk about this to compare like those scientists or people trying to save monarchs to like the de-extinctionists who are just so excited about the technology and there's no hint of grief you know in the way that they speak and i think that just is very telling and in, in the, the character of people involved in this work. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful, Lisa. And uh, thank you very much for your thank presentation you. and uh, for uh, this beautiful uh, conversation.